Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say, welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. We're going to finish the, this generation shall not pass. What did Jesus mean by that? He meant that when the generation that would be living at the time that these seven events that he had mentioned in Mark 13 and Matthew 24, that generation would not pass away until all prophecies had been fulfilled. Now, in the first part of this lecture, we'll just recap real briefly, and then we're going to start plowing on, is we documented that a generation, in one sense, was 40 years, because the type was those that wandered in the wilderness, many of them deceived, and God, because they would not obey Him, they were afraid of giants. When there were no giants, God had already had them removed. Uh, they were afraid uh, to move into the land, so God let them die there. Now, there are no giants today except in the minds of people. When you're doing God's work and you take the authority that God has given you through the Son as watchmen, as we found in the con closing verses of that 13th chapter of Mark, but you have to take that authority. First, you've got to be familiar with our Father's Word, whereby you understand that authority. And then naturally, God blesses you, for man can do very little except God touch him or her. And then things begin to happen. God is in control. So, with that having been said, there is a 40-year generation. There is also a 72-year generation, 70 to 72, and there's a 120-year generation as it's stipulated in Genesis 6, verse uh, 3, 3 to 4. I want to go now to the New Testament to document that these were types of what you should be on guard for in the end times. The years do not really matter. The consummation, that is to say, as the events come to pass, that does. Because the, as those seven events just happen to be the seven seals from the book of Revelation, as it is mentioned in Mark 13. And as you see those benchmarks pass, then you know approximately what part of that generation has passed, regardless of how long it is. In other words, what I'm saying, Daniel chapter 12, the wise shall understand. You're supposed to. Our Father expects you to. No man knows the instant, but the wise do know the season. Turn with me, if you would, to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. We're going to document that what happened in the wilderness is a type for you today, even in this generation, the generation of the fig tree, which quite frankly is the final. Fini, that's it. There will not be another generation before the second advent. It is written. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1, and it reads, Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. So I don't want you to be ignorant about what happened when Moses led the people. Verse 2, and were all, I repeat, some of them, the good ones, the bad ones, no, all, all, uh, were, were all baptized under Moses, unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. And of course, within that cloud was that Holy Spirit. Verse 3, and did all eat the same spiritual meat. Even the wicked ones that would die in the wilderness partook of the manna. Now, what does that say to you? They should have known better. 
If God sends you a gift from heaven and feeds you the manna and the quail, you would think that that would cause you to believe upon him and trust. Did they? A lot of them didn't. But they were all given the gift. In other words, God is always fair. But you write your own ticket. You make your own bed. And quite frankly, you sleep in it. And unfortunately for some of your loved ones, they might have to sleep in it with you. But at least they make their own bed also. They can leave it. When it comes down to a critical part, am I saying divorce is okay? It has nothing to do with it. Never let anyone rob you of your right to follow God. They have no right to do that. 1 Corinthians, this same book, chapter 7, stipulates that. Verse 4. And did all drink the same spiritual drink? For they drink of that spiritual rock. You know the rock that Moses struck. You know the rock, the Jacob's pillow that was carried for miles and miles. That followed them and that rock was Christ. The Savior always looking over them. He was there. Verse 5. But with many of them, God was not well pleased. He still fed them. They still had the opportunity to drink. And let that be the living water. Let that be the manna, the food from heaven. They had that opportunity, but God was still not well pleased. Do you want to know why? You should. Because if you don't, it could be that he's well pleased with you. Because this is a type. For they were overthrown in the wilderness. They were deceived. Verse 6. Now these things were our examples. Beloved, don't ever forget that. These things were our types. They happened so that you would know what will befall you in this generation. No excuse. God has, makes his manna, his word, and the spiritual water from Christ the rock available for anybody that will partake. If you don't, I'm sorry, that's your own fault. Okay? These things happened as examples to the intent. We should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Well, what did they do? What did they do that so displeased God? Well, have you ever studied what happened in the wilderness? How they wondered? What transpired there? You should, because God made it, or has made it very clear to you from his word, those were types of exactly what's happening to you today. When you create a marriage between current events, worldwide, especially the Middle East, the barometer, Judea, the barometer of the world, as to prophecy, of course, not everybody's a believer, so they don't worry about it anyway. But I hope that isn't your case. Because we're going to, I'm going to share just some of those little examples with you here in a moment. Again, very important. The Old Testament is made a part of the new right here because those were, in other words, God's way of teaching is illustration. He had those events transpire as a teacher for you. The law, the Torah, is our schoolmaster. It's your teacher. And Christ, of course, present. And any child can say, oh, this is what happened. Yes, now I understand. It's so simple. When one be stops wrestling with their own self and begins to listen to our Father, they were examples, and it will happen exactly. You can trust God exactly the same. Verse 7, neither be ye idolaters. Don't start worshiping somebody else, especially the spurious Messiah, as were some of them. As it is written, when you hear that sharpen up, it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Do you know where that's written? Exodus chapter 32, verse 6. And you can follow it on through to about 25. What did they do? Moses is up on the mount. 
God with his own hand is writing the commandments. There is this group that were all baptized in the cloud, shared the manna, drank the, wa drank the water, partook of God's blessings. They partook of the very manna God had given them. And then Moses has been out of their sight for a few days. 40 to be specific. 40 means uh, probation in biblical numerics. They didn't muster up to the probation they were under because they began to play, but it wasn't play like you might think play. Uh-uh. They wanted a God. Can you imagine that? They wanted a different way of worship. And do you know who gave it to them? This is very important because it's your example. The head preacher, Aaron. They went to Aaron and said, we want a God. And he said, bring all your gold. Well, that's typical for the head preacher, isn't it? I mean, there's nothing new under the sun. He said, bring all your money, gold. And he puts together a golden calf. And here you have our people worshiping a facade a, a, an image, man-made, molded with hands, and set up on a dumb stool, table, and they worshiped and had a big party and were worshiping this when they were partaking of our Father's food, of His water, of His truth, and the preacher put it there. So what does that say to you today? You'd better be very careful of false teachings that preachers, the head preacher, the head priest, Aaron in this case, wavered. Would Aaron have done that? I would like to think that he wouldn't have. But God caused him to do it, so you, you will either learn from it or you will discard it. That's up to you. I, I'm not, I, I won't sweat it. It's your problem. But when some minister begins to teach traditions of men and flyaway doctrine rather than exactly as it is written in God's Word that any child could understand, Christ will not return until the seventh trump and the spurious Messiah appears in the fifth and the sixth, which means before exactly as it's written. They're going to play and the angel of death is going to deceive them again all over even after the blood of the Lamb was placed on the door of some, and many of them passed on through, they were deceived by the same angel in the wilderness because they marched in that wilderness until they were dead. They were robbed by their own choice. They would not listen to our Father. Now, our Father sent the Word, and I hope there was one thing, if you ever remember any verse out of this lecture, this generation shall not pass, I hope you go back to the stipulation where Christ was speaking in Mark 13, and He said, when you see the fig tree in place shooting forth leaves, know that this generation shall not pass until all these things are complete. The hev this heaven age will pass away, this earth age will pass away, but God's Word will never pass away. This Word, as it is written, will never pass away. Why would you want to listen to some man then without checking him out in God's Word? I marvel that someone would. Well, I don't read well. Well, Pray to the Holy Spirit to give you a little unction and guidance and don't be ignorant. That's what Paul started in verse 1, his words. Brethren, I would not have you, I would uh, not that you should be ignorant. He said these, these were types, they were examples. Aaron led them astray in the priesthood. They believed him after, while they were eating our Father's blessings. Of course, you know the story, Moses come down off that mountain and and Joshua, I think, had waited for him there, and Joshua says, I hear the people at war. And Moses said, I hear laughter of somebody partying, party time. And he threw the tablets 
at the base of the mount and broke them. He had just begged God not to destroy them, and God said, well, my wrath is hot about them, and then Moses' wrath gets hot about it. Verse 8, don't be deceived. You've been warned from your father's word. It is written, verse 8, neither let us commit fornication as some of them committed and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. That takes place in about Numbers 25, 19. People like to tempt God. Don't do it, friend. You're playing with the consuming fire when you play with your father. Verse 9, Neither let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted and were destroyed of serpents. What serpent? The old snake. How much plainer could he make it that the serpent's coming back to the people, that is to say, the spurious Messiah? That, uh, somebody said, well, whoa, you mean a snake? No, read Revelation chapter 20, verse 1. That old devil, the serpent, which is the dragon, which is, is Satan, which is also the Antichrist. Do you want him to cause you death? Many already are spiritually. Verse 10, Neither murmur ye as some of them also murmured. Complain, just complain. Let is God let this happen to me. You do it to yourself. And we're destroyed of the destroyer. There is a destroying angel, and he's none other than Satan. And if you murmur and give him a chance to work into your family, he'll destroy that also. Verse 11, listen again. I plead to your wisdom, listen. 11, now all these things, how many of them? Now all these things happened unto them for in samples, an old Anglo-Saxon word that means examples. All of them happened to them so you would have an example. And they are written for our admonition, our warning, upon whom the ends of the world are come, the last generation. This generation shall not pass until all these things have been fulfilled. God's word is so fair and so complete and yet so simple because it's like taking building blocks with a child and saying, now these are trees and if we have one here and one here and one there, how many trees do we have? Well, that's one, two, that's three. That's simple. All these things happen. That's why I can say that I don't think Aaron on his own initiative would have, I don't think that one preacher would have brought that evil, false worship upon those people or allowed them but God would lead him in the way that he allowed it so that you could see the example today that you'd better beware of churchosity. You'd better be aware of traditions of men that teach something that is not written, such as flyaway doctrine. I'll be very plain and specific. Even though it is written in Ezekiel 13 that God hates, God is against those that teach his people to fly to save their souls. He wants you to have the gospel armor on and in place and stand against the fiery darts, that is to say the lies of deception of this destroying angel, which is the spurious Messiah. It shall happen, and it shall happen in and to this generation. Ends of the world are come. Well, what a fascinating time to live. Do you know what that last verse said? I hope you never forget it. All those things of the Old Testament happen so that you can study them geographically as well, taking into consideration the migrations, putting the pencil to it, and understand with clarity what it is our Father is doing in this world today. Verse 12. 
Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. You listen to traditions of men. You listen to the head preacher instead of checking him out in God's Word. I hope you understand, if the man checks out in the Word, then he's a preacher indeed. But if he's lying to you, he's a messenger of hell. In priest robes, Satan makes much gain from pulpits, and it's really sad. Well, how do I know the difference? Well, whether they're teaching God's Word, it's real simple. A child can decide. If they're not teaching God's Word and they're teaching traditions against the Word, I would think anyone would be intelligent enough to know, hey, this is not for me. What he's saying is, be on guard. Well, I just am not very intelligent and I just, well, he drew you a picture. And listen to this, 13. There hath no temptation taken you but such as is common to man. Let me explain that to you. There is no trouble or temptation that has come up in your life that is not a very common thing in every man's life. You're not out on a limb all by yourself. And what about it? But God is faithful, and don't you ever forget it. Who will not, I repeat, will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able. He knows your breaking point, will not tempt you above that ye are able, but will, I repeat, but will with the temptation also make a way of escape that ye may be able to bear it. Now, did it say he was never going to let any temptation come on you? No, it didn't say that. Do you know why? He's not afraid of you facing a little temptation because it toughens you, makes a better person out of you. And sometimes you'll even fall for it. But if you love him and repent, he'll always give you a way out. Always. You can count on it. You will never find a more reassuring verse in God's Word than that verse following such a meaty, heavy subject where there could be so many things that might be unclear in your mind, then you can believe and have faith to know that he will let you know. 14, wherefore, my dearly beloved, flee from idolatry. What is idolatry? Worshiping false religions, being misled by priests such as Aaron was in this case as a type and an example of bringing you into worshiping the destroyer, which is to say Satan. Traditions of men, other gods. Verse 15, I speak as to wise men, judge ye what I say. He said, I give you the benefit of the doubt. I'm speaking as though you're a wise person. You judge what I say, Paul said, and I say to you today, you be the judge. It's your life. You know what you're going to do with it. And you know, many of you, that you've had a destiny all your life, a purpose. You may find it in the Word. God may lead you into that. I know one thing. All that know the truth will be delivered up before the spurious Messiah. Whereby, as it is written in that Mark 13 concerning that parable of the fig tree, to be a witness, allowing the Holy Spirit to come through and witness against this charade that will be brought upon the world by the religious community with Satan at the helm. Frightening? No, don't let it be. There is no temptation that God himself will not allow you, that, that he will allow come upon you that is above your ability to recognize it and do something about it. He mentions stand. And naturally, that's what the gospel armor does when it is on and in place. Turn with me real quickly to Jeremiah chapter 24. I want to document the fig tree, what it, why Jesus would mention 
the fig tree, why he would bring that particular thing to the forefront in something as important as the final generation that you could judge time by. Verse 20, chapter 24 of the great book of um, Jeremiah, and I'm going to begin reading. The Lord showed me, this is the prophet Jeremiah, and behold, two baskets of figs were set before the temple of the Lord. First of all, mark the, ge the um, geography here. Where is the temple of the Lord? It's in Jerusalem on Mount Zion. It was at that time. After that, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, had carried away captive Jeconiah, the son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Judah, and the ha princes of Judah, with the carpenters and smiths from Jerusalem, and had brought them to Babylon. Confusion. Now understand it was after that fact. Now he's going to show you something, and this is why he told you to learn, not maybe, learn that parable. Verse 2, what did he see? One basket had very good figs even like the figs that are first ripe. Boy, that's the cream of the crop. That's the first fruits. And the other basket had very naughty figs, uh, which could not be eaten. They were so bad. Verse 3, Then said the Lord unto me, What seest thou, Jeremiah? Question. He's holding a little school class here. How you doing, friend? Listen. And I said, Figs, the good figs, very good. And the evil, very evil. They cannot be eaten. They are so evil. You got two trees, the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The story begins in Genesis uh, in, from the very beginning, which to partake of. Verse 4, again the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Keep your geography straight. Thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, and the, we're talking to Judah here. Like these good figs, so will I acknowledge them that are carried away captive of Judah. The subject is Judah, whom I have sent out of this place into the land of the Chaldeans, that's Babylon, for their good, not their bad. God knows what he's doing. Uh, they were not mistreated there all that badly in Babylon. Remember, Daniel was, he, he was sent to college, all right, by Nebuchadnezzar. Verse 6, For I will set mine eyes upon them for good, talking about Judah, and I will bring them again, I will bring them again to this land. What land? Jerusalem. And I will build them and not pull them down, and I will plant them and not pluck them up. When did that take place? The year of our Lord, 1948. Not the house of Israel, but Judah. But bless your hearts, don't you ever miss the fact that two baskets went back to Judea. It's speaking of those that claim to be of our brother Judah and do lie and are of the synagogue of Satan, the Kenites, the sons of Cain, as it is written, not my words, but as it is written in Revelation chapter 2, verse 9, concerning them. They've given our brother Judah a great deal, of the true Judah, a great deal of problems. Verse 7, and I will give them an heart to know me. That's to say the good figs that I am the Lord, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God, for they shall return unto me with their whole heart. That's to say the good figs. So, this documents what happened, whereby you can clock off 1948 as the time that the fig, the good fig, as well as the bad, were set out. Horticulture documents that you use a shoot to set out a fig tree. It begins producing leaves readily. Okay, I'm gonna conclude this lecture of this generation. What did we just do? As I'm turning to the book of Hebrews. What did we just prove? We documented the location geographically, Jerusalem. 
We also documented who would return there to institute the planting of the fig tree, the good fig. And I think many of you that are, um, are senior citizens now can absolutely remember the announcement of the planting of that fig tree. Okay, Hebrews chapter 3, let's pick it up if we may at verse 9. Listen carefully. When your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works forty years, ten, wherefore I was grieved with that generation, and said, They do always err in their heart, and they have not known my ways. How do you know God's way? By being familiar with his plan. He's grieved with a lot today, beloved. He's grieved with a lot of pulpits that do not teach his word chapter by chapter and verse by verse. Verse 11, So I swear in my wrath they shall not enter into my rest. And many won't. From what generation? This generation. Many that think they are locked away and secure and heaven bound with wings of a butterfly. Sorry, friend. It's Satan that loads that bus. And God's word declares it specifically and plainly. Verse 12, take heed, that means you be real careful, brethren, lest there be any of you, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. That's departing from his word, the living word, listening to men and traditions betting your soul on it. How cheap souls go sometimes. How, how looking for thrills in religion. People sell out their souls for laughing. For I, I could name several things they do that just sells their souls into traditions that are contrary to the living word of God. Verse 13. And exhort one another daily. You work at it. Exhort means study daily while it is called today, especially in this generation, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin, the deception and the splendor of sin. I want to be in the biggest, I want to be a member of the biggest church and wear the best fluffy robes of anyone to set forth a good look as I walk before God's little people. You ever met someone like that? Be careful, friend. They're a dime a dozen. And never teach God's word, except to pull a little scripture here, a one verse reverend. Knows more than God does, I suppose. Don't fall for it. It's too late in this generation to be eating uh, from God's table and then getting up and playing church. Verse 14, the word deceitfulness can, can uh, glamorous even. No, it looks so glamorous. 14, for we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. Can you do that? Can you hold your confidence in the word of God steadfast to the end? Or do you want to listen to a bunch of poppycock that someone's spewing off out of a pressure cooker over here in some uh, supposed house of God when it's nothing but a brothel for Satan. How do you tell? Well, the example is set forth. Is the, has the example been taught to you? Is God's word taught there? If it isn't, it's not a house of God, certainly. There's only one way you can hold confidence steadfast until the end of this generation is to know God's word and have God's blessings or you're going to be deceived. Verse 15, while it is said today, if ye will hear his voice, not my voice, not some man's voice, God's voice from his word, harden not your hearts as in the, as in the provocation. 
many in the name of religion do very strange things. You see, Christianity is not a religion. It's a reality, and you're living it, friend. How are you doing? 16. For some, when they had heard, did provoke, howbeit not all that came out of Egypt by Moses. They died in the wilderness. Hey, friend, have you read of the wilderness in Revelation chapter 12 that the woman flees to and the old Satan is just throwing out a flood of lies after her, just like the flood of Noah? Hmm? How are you doing? You getting your feet wet? It's happening, friend. There's a wilderness. It's a jungle out there away from the Word of God. And in His Word, you don't have to fear a thing because you have the authority to take charge. 17. But with whom was he grieved 40 years? Was it not with them that had sinned whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? Why did they? They didn't obey the word. They listened to men, listened to Aaron, listened to other people. They didn't check out God's Word. Do you understand that while they were doing this, the plates, the, the tablets that God wrote with His own hand was headed down to them. They wanted something to worship written with the finger of God. They're gone, friend, because people like to party in religion. They weren't partying like a, a drunken fest. They were playing church something to worship, playing laughing spirit with the Holy Spirit. He doesn't like it. Verse 19, 18, And to whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest, but to them that believe not? It's up to you, friend. You see, no man can do this for you. You either believe your Father and the simplicity in which he teaches through the Son, or you're just not a believer, I'm sorry. If you will listen to man's rantings rather than studying God's Word chapter by chapter and verse by verse, I'm sorry, you're not for real. Verse 19, so we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. I don't know, do you believe? Are you a believer? It's up to you. I can't help, and you're not going to have this on your character generator to complete this lecture. I'm going to the book of Matthew. I just want to, I just want to jog your memory just a little bit. Matthew 24. And if I remember right, it's going to be about verse 32, 3, 32. I'm just going to read it to you real quickly. Now learn a parable of the fig tree. This is the same as we started in the Mark 13. When his branch is yet tender and putteth forth leaves, ye know that summer is nigh. It's the last generation. So likewise ye, when ye shall see all these things, that's those six, seven things mentioned, know that it is near even at the door. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled, period. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words, this word, the living word, the word of God, shall not pass away. But of that hour, um, of that day and hour knoweth no man, not the angels of heaven, but my Father. Verse 37, listen to the warning he gives you just following this. This is really why I came here. Concerning the last generation, listen to it, beloved. But as the days of Noah were, that's the days of Noah, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Do you want to know what it's like when Christ returns? Going to be just like it was in the days of Noah. What does that mean? 38. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage to who? to Satan and his fallen angels. And the offspring from the daughters of Adam were Gebar, giants. And God, the, the womb through which Christ would come, umbilical cord to umbilical cord, 
was destroying itself with fallen angels, Satan's own plan to destroy the coming of Messiah until the day that Noah entered the ark. It means they're going to be giving and taking in marriage again. You can maybe understand why back in chapter 10 or 11, rather, that Paul would say, women, keep your head covered because of the angels. They're coming back. Satan and his angels will be cast from heaven, as it is written in Revelation chapter 12, verse 7. And then the scriptures following that bring out the flood that Satan will send out after her, just like the flood of Noah, a five-month period. How interesting. Well, this generation shall not pass until all these things are fulfilled. It's up to you. It's your business. It's your father. It's his word. What are you going to do about it? All right, bless your heart. You listen a moment, won't you please? The book of St. John. What a fantastic book we have here in tape for you, for your convenience of studying as you drive or whatever the case might be in the comforts of your own home. St. John, the writer of Revelation as well as this great book of St. John. John taught in a way that he not only interpreted, translated the word and, and interpreted, fully translated the names as well as other things that made this word, this book, so easy to understand, helping the very reader see Christ in his work as God, Savior of the world. This book of John giving you the identity of the Kenites, as well as those events that would transpire in the end generation. That's your generation, beloved. All right, bless your hearts. There we are back again. Let's have the 800 number, if we may. 1-800-643-4645. That number good from Puerto Rico, throughout the U.S., Alaska, Hawaii, all over Canada. If the spirit moves, you have a question, share it. You that listen by shortwave around the world at this time, it's always a pleasure to hear from you. Your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address. You got a prayer request? He's your father. He knows you. He knows where you are. He knows what you're doing. And he will never allow any temptation to be above what you can handle if you got a little grit. I mean, after all, you should have a little grit. You're a child of God. You're his child. Offspring. Now, Father, around the globe at this time, we ask that you lead, guide, direct, touch, prosper, heal in Yahshua's precious name. Amen. Okay, let's get some questions going here. Christine from Hawaii. How do you explain the scripture which talks about uh, baptizing the dead? I get confused. Well, hon, I can understand why. And what she's pulling from, let me see, it's 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and it stipulates there, this: always watch your subject and your object. The subject is, do you believe Christ rose from the dead? All right? That's the subject. It says, why would you, if you don't believe Christ rose from the dead, why would you want to be baptized in his name? You see, the Greek gets it a little confused. It's not, it would do you no good. You could baptize yourself a hundred times for somebody that's already dead. It wouldn't help them, all right? The subject is, is whether you believe Christ rose and lives and is not dead. Uh, Delita from Illinois. I would like to know if I can be forgiven even though I've committed about every sin there is. Well, you're honest, and that's one of the most admirable traits a person can have. I don't know why he wouldn't forgive you. If you repent, naturally he will. Repent and mean it from the heart, and he loves you and he will forgive you. Irene from Michigan. If we repent and are sorry for our sins and God forgives us, why would we have to be accountable for every sin on Judgment Day? Well, you're not. He, haven't you read? He doesn't even want to hear about it again. You're only judged for those sins you haven't repented for on Judgment Day. Irene, I want you to look forward to Judgment Day for a different reason. Boy, we're going to collect the rewards. Payday, all right? Now, that may sound a little graphic, but 
I mean, I, what I want you to think is positive instead of negative. When God forgives you, that's it. It's gone. You forget it also. And forgive yourself. Okay, Pastor Murray, how do you explain what Paul meant when he wrote <clears throat> Timothy about women as teachers in the church in 1 Timothy 2.11? Is may, may our Father in the name of Jesus continue to bless you. Oh, he sure does. He, well, what did Paul mean? You got to remember that it, it was uh, almost a death sentence to be teaching God's word during Paul's time, if caught by certain people. It is a lot easier to humiliate a woman publicly than a man. This is my opinion now. Therefore, a woman could remain silent while she was learning, but do you know something? a man should remain silent while he's learning also. They should both remain silent if they're learning. They don't know enough to teach anybody anything. So they should keep their mouth shut. And many times this is why I said, a woman ought to keep silent in church. Well, it's, a, it's an old idiom. And women kind of suffer a bad rap on this one because I'll tell you what, I've heard men chatter more than women in church. And you know something? I'll tell them to shut up or get out. I'm, I'm a real gentle, loving person, but I don't put up with nonsense, whether it's male or female. So it's just a figure of speech. Don't let anybody shake you. The word is very clear that both men and women, as it is written in Acts chapter 2, will be moved by the Holy Spirit to teach, and they were throughout the Bible. Um, okay, enough said. John from, from uh, PN. That's got to be Pennsylvania. That's the wrong letters, but I'm going to say it's Pennsylvania, okay? Pastor Murray, last week someone asked a question about your flag. And you asked them, do you have, do you know what tape, what type of flag it was? And you told them it was a U.S. Marine Corps dress flag and you shed blood for it and would do it again for this country, yes. And that you were very proud of the flag, and I am. And you told them not to mess with your flag. You bet. Don't anybody ever mess with my flag or you're going to get a, a, a big fist right in the face if they do it deliberately. You bet. That's the way a preacher should talk about it if he's a Marine. All right? I was a Marine Staff Sergeant during the Vietnam War, and I was told I had too much pride, and it's written in the Bible that personal pride is detested and is wrong. Would you please help me out on this? Any scripture in the Bible that will help me and tell me, is it wrong to be proud that I'm a U.S. Marine um, or first a Christian? Hey, what are you listening to that wimp for? You're a Marine and you're listening to some wimp tell you that you shouldn't be proud of the Corps when it has produced the freedom in part that this nation lavishes under that we have the freedom to teach God's Word proudly and boldly? Don't let some wimp that is so ignorant of God's Word that he probably doesn't, well, I better be careful here. Let's back up because it might even be a preacher that told you that and Lord only knows I wouldn't want to hurt their feelings much, would I? He's a wimp. He's just jealous because he didn't have the guts to serve the country himself, probably took off maybe to Moscow and maybe inhaled instead of exhaled or something, all right? I don't like wimps, and don't ever, as a Marine, and he closes Semper Fi, don't listen to wimps. The pride spoken of in the Bible means self-pride of self. Your Self-pride is not self when it's one of the greatest fighting forces that God ever put together to keep free people and allows this great nation to be the superpower of superpowers in this end time generation. You'll have ignoramuses that'll call and say, that isn't a U.S. Marine flag, it has fringe on it. Well, they're ignorant too. They've listened to a Kenite publishing a bunch of slogans and they're so ignorant they fall for it. Once a Marine, always a Marine. And fighting Marine, hey, don't, you tell that wimp that this pastor told him to take a hike and give him a few of the other old things that we follow that up in the genuine core, all right? Tell him to sit on it, 
All right, Deborah from California, when you are trying to get someone to change and open their eyes and they just don't listen, when do you give up? When the seed doesn't grow, only, remember this, you can plant the seed, but if God doesn't cause it to grow, hey, that's it. They're not good enough for our Father. He doesn't want them. Because if you go past that, you're casting pearls before a swine. God says swine are unclean. Leave them alone. If they come back to you later, if the seed sprouts, fine. Otherwise, you don't have time for... There, there are too many... Uh, we used to say in the Marine Corps that there are 10% um, fluff-offs, all right, or something like that. And they're always going to be that 10%. Well, in real life, there's a lot more than 10% because there's just a few good men ever get into the Corps. And I'm proud of all the services that here I'm, but only a few good men get in and to have 10% there, it runs about 80 in real life. That uh, you don't have time to mess with them. Just get the very best. That's what you want. People that love the Lord and, and His Word. Maurice from Indiana. I've been divorced from my wife for some time. She wants to get back together. Is this all right in the eyes of God? Well, do you think that Jesus has the power to forgive you and her both for any mistake made? Contrary to even the old law that says it's not really a good idea because if one of you has been with someone else, yeah, it's pretty hard. It causes some trouble. But if you both love the Lord and if you love each other, Jesus forgives it. It's forgot about. It never happened. And you're happy, hopefully. All right? Dominic from Florida. Can we in modern day times perform healings? No, you can't. And nobody could in the old times. Such as laying on hands. No, you can't do it. Or did they just pertain to Christ's day? No, they just pertain to Christ. I don't care how much you lay your hands on, you, catch my word, you can't heal anybody. But you might ask him to do it and he can sure get it done. But I'm sorry, you can't cut it. You have to ask him to. I hope you understand my point. Darlene from Ohio, do you think Satan will deceive people after they have been through the millennium? I find this hard to believe after seeing Jesus in his glory. Read Revelation chapter 20. They sure do it. I have trouble believing it too. But then look around you today. Look what you've got for, for human beings and what they'll do. They're... they're you know, it is written that in the end times the leaders will have children's minds and I really think that our court system today in a large part, especially California, is just exactly that. Okay, I probably shouldn't say that all over. Government, children's minds. Common sense seems to have slipped through a crack in the floor somewhere. But we've got the victory and God's in control. James, Lucille and James from Colorado. When the King James Bible was compiled, do you know the way that they selected scriptures to be canonized? Well, the King James was done in 1611. The canonization took place around 300 A.D., uh, okay? Um, and um, so uh, you need to, we carry the old King James here. I had to have them reprinted, and Nelson was going to drop it, and I ordered 5,000 of them so that it would be present so people could read the letter that the translators wrote to the people. I mean, it's an exact copy of the old original 1611, and that letter is priceless. Read it, and you'll find out. Anita from Florida. We're, we're, when our bodies are transfigured into the spiritual body, and if a woman is pregnant at that time, will the child... At the as the woman's bodies change, be at the same time. Yeah, they're both adults. All right, God just loans them to us, and uh, so it is. All right, uh, David from Maryland. Where, where in the Bible does it talk about the rapture? I'm sorry, son, it doesn't. The word you will never find the word rapture in God's word. All right, unless some man writes it in the margin. It's not in the scripts. Sorry doesn't talk about it. It talks about where the dead are in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through about uh, 17, but th that's not rapture as some um, preachers teach. 
I'll let that go at that. Billy from Missouri, I don't understand about people passing before you. I lost my wife and I want to be with her again. Will this ever be possible? We, we just got through doing Ezekiel, son. Uh, bless your heart. Read Ezekiel again. Yes, you can even help her there. Ezekiel 44. Read it. Long about verse 23. Benny from Alabama. What does God say about killing a man in self-defense? He says it's fantastic. Uh, you know, you would be ignorant if somebody was going to kill you if you didn't kill them first. All right? And a person always stays prepared if if uh, someone's breaking in your home or something like that to do just such a thing. Make sure you know that you're legal and so forth. Deuteronomy 19. Well, uh, I mean, that person's fixing to kill you. You get him first. That's the way to do it. Vera from Georgia. Will the earth change back to the original state when the change of our spiritual bodies at the same time? No, it won't. Sorry, that won't happen until the end of the millennium. And then on the first day of the eternal, it is perfect all over. Revelation 21. Diane from Ohio. At what point do you believe God puts a soul into a person at birth or conception? Jesus was conceived and Mary ran the same day to Mary, I'm sorry, to uh, Elizabeth. And John, being six months in the womb, leapt because the spirit was approaching of Christ at conception. The soul enters at conception. And if anything happens to that soul, it goes instantly back to the Father, innocent. I'm out of time. This generation has got gray hair on it. We're living in a time that is so fantastic and so wonderful, but yet at the same time, so many people deceive. See that you're not. We're brought to you by your tithes and offerings. We've helped you. You help us keep coming to you. Once you do that, but this is most important, that you stay in His Word. You know what? Every day in His Word is a good day, even with a little temptation. Do you know why? Jesus is the living Word. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. You have been viewing the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you are interested